Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. So in today's video, I'll be solving the February March 2017 paper. So the first question asks us to find butane. Obviously, butane is an alkane due to the ending A and E, and alkanes are saturated, meaning that they only have single bonds. Now, the prefix but indicates that there's four carbons. So you have meth, eth, prop, but, and so on. And obviously, the only one that has four carbons and is completely saturated is A. Now, which two compounds are structural isomers of each other? That would have to be B and C. Structural isomerism, basically they have the same molecular formula, but a different bonding arrangement. And there's three types of structural isomerism. The first one is chain isomerism, the second is position isomerism, and the third is functional group isomerism. I'll place a photo for you guys to understand it. Now, which compound can be made by reacting an alkene with bromine? Obviously, that would be D because if you have, for example, ethene, you would open up the double bond and then the bromine will attach. And of course, it doesn't matter where you attach the bromine, whether it's at the top or to the side or to the bottom, because single bonds do rotate and they end up being the same. Now, which compound is a saturated compound? Again, that would be A, because it has no double bonds or triple bond. It's a hydrocarbon because it only has hydrogen and carbon. Now, which compound has the empirical formula C2H5? That would also be A, because empirical formula is the simplest proportion of an element in a compound. So now, for example, A is, has 4 carbons and 10 hydrogens. You can simplify that by dividing it by 2. You get C2H5. Then for B and C, you get C2H4. For D, you get um, CH2Br. And for E, you're not changing at all because you can't get decimal. I mean, you, you shouldn't have decimals or fractions. So it stays as it is C3H6Br2. Now, um, complete combustion, the products are always carbon dioxide and water. And if it's incomplete, then it's going to be carbon monoxide and water. All right, so for part B, butamine would be the answer because it has the largest MR meaning it's you know the heaviest so it has something viscous has a thick sticky consistency something viscous basically has a high viscosity kind of like honey and you know you know honey has a high viscosity compared to like olive oil now which one has the smallest um which is the smallest molecule that would be refinery gas since it's released at the top meaning it has the lowest boiling point and so it's the least, you know, heavy. Now, which one has the weakest force of attraction between the molecules would have to be refinery gas. Emphasis on gas because, you know, um, gas molecules, they have a weak force of attraction between one another and they're usually neglected. Now, the fraction that's used for jet fuel is kerosene. You need to memorize it and you can memorize it like a phone number, RGN, KDF, LB. Now, petroleum in part Y is either vaporized, or you can say boiled, heated, or evaporated. There are so many videos online, especially on YouTube, you guys can check out. Now, in order to get the ammonium dichromate, we are going to filter it from the solution and we're going to wash off the residue, which is the silver dichromate, using water in order to make sure there's no ammonium nitrate with it. And then we're going to just dry it uh, between filter papers or you can just place it in a warm area. And that's how you get the silver dichromate. Now, the charge on the silver ion is plus one, so there's two of it, so it's going to total to positive two. Now, the dichromate ion is Cr2O7, and the overall charge is zero, so then that would mean it has to be negative two, because two minus two is zero. Okay, so for the ionic equation, make sure that it's balanced, and it's only using ions that actually react, you know? For example, here you have two silver ions plus one dichromate, it gives you one silver dichromate. It's always Ag plus and zinc 2 plus, remember that. Spectator ions are ions that exist in the same form on both of the reactant and product sides. So basically, they're not really changing and you don't really need to place them in the ionic uh, formula. Now the universal indicator will end up turning blue because ammonia is produced and ammonia is basic. So anything that's basic can accept a proton. And you know how hydrogen only has one proton, one electron. So hydrogen ion is H plus. That means it lost that one electron. That means it only has one proton, making it a proton basically. And so you'll end up with ammonium ion. And so yeah, you should also, you know, memorize the colors for the universal indicator. Now, explain why a red solid appeared along the line marked S. That's because the dichromate ions are heavier than the silver ions, right? So they have a greater MR. 
So the dichromate ions will diffuse or move more slowly and of course where they meet is where the reaction will occur and this silver uh, dichromate will form which is a red solid. Now the experiment was repeated at a higher temperature so of course the reaction will be faster or you can say less than five minutes and because they mentioned that it took around five minutes and that's because the particles move faster, they have more kinetic energy. Now, uh, ammonium dichromate undergoes thermal decomposition. Thermal decomposition is the breakdown of a compound when heated, thus you have thermal, has to do with heat, decomposition has to do with breakdown. Now write the chemical equation, so you have the ammonium dichromate, it breaks down to nitrogen, uh, chromium-3 oxide, and for water molecules, so chromium-3, so you know that 3 is for the chromium, so Cr3+, plus O2-, minus, you know, you cross them, you get Cr2O3, and you can't simplify it because we don't want decimals. And that's it. And then equilibrium is where forward and backward reaction occur at equal rates, and the concentration of the substances on each side remain constant in a closed system. So if that gas released, it would not be the same anymore. Now, increasing the temperature will increase the rate of reaction because um, the particles have more energy, so there's a greater frequency of collision, more successful collision as more particles have energy that's greater than the activation energy. Activation energy is the energy that's needed in order for a reaction to occur. So if you have more than it, then guess what? The reaction will happen. Now, this will have an effect on the equilibrium because the forward reaction is exothermic. And the experiment is going to do whatever it can, or the equilibrium will do whatever it can to oppose this change. And what it's going to do is favor the reverse, the endothermic reaction. Endothermic reactions are the ones who take in that heat. So instead of when you're giving all the extra heat, it doesn't want it. So it takes it in and favors the reverse reaction. Now, state and explain the effect, if any, in decreasing the position of, you know, the pressure. Of course, there's no change, simply because the number of moles are the same on both sides. You can look at the coefficients. Now here we have oxygen, nitrogen, and chlorine. Oxygen has eight electrons, nitrogen seven, chlorine 17. It's a double bond between nitrogen and oxygen, so there's gonna be a total of four electrons there. Two from nitrogen, two from oxygen. For the chlorine, one from uh, chlorine and one from nitrogen. Now, if you write out the electron configuration for chlorine, it's two, eight, and seven. So two in the first shell, eight in the second, seven in the last. And so that is a total of 17 and you do the same for nitrogen and oxygen. When you're doing this, you only show the valence electrons, the ones on the outside. So we have seven, and we already used one from chlorine, so we're gonna add in the other six. Nitrogen, we use three, and so we're gonna place the other two. Oxygen, we use two, and so we're gonna place the other four. And so you notice that all of them have sort of like eight electrons, which is the octet, keeping them all stable. Now. Why do they have such a low boiling point? Simply because they have weak forces of attraction between other NOCl molecules, or you can say they have weak forces of attraction, uh, weak forces of intermolecular attraction. And intermolecular means within the molecule itself. So between the nitrogen, oxygen, chlorine themselves, it's not that strong. And like either one, you can get the marks for it. Now that is it for this um, exam, and I'll do questions 4 to 7 in my other video. Stay tuned for that because I don't want this video to be too long. And anyways, I'll see you guys next time. Bye bye!